So I have a few Unify switches here to review. This is the Unify 24 on top and 48 at the bottom. Named the Unify 24 and 48, but technically the 24 is a 26 port model because we have a couple SFPs and the 48 has 52 ports because we have two SFP module ports and two SFP plus module ports on it. So we'll talk about first what comes in the box. I unboxed them and the unboxing is not as cool as like an iPhone or anything. So uh, I didn't bother like the whole removal process. If you're into that, I'm sure someone's done that. Uh, power cords in here for each of them. This is the same parts in each of these. Uh, heavy power cord, not one of those two flimsy ones. That's good. The rack ears. I like the rack ears on this. They're not chintzy. They are actually pretty thick. They, I've seen some of them have almost like paper thin rack ears. And these also are like double enforced on the uh, rolled edge here. Uh, also not sharp, not gonna cut yourself on them. So good, they did a nice job on that. Bolts to hold the rack ears, or I'm sorry, screws to hold the rack ears. And uh, rack nuts to mount in the rack, your standard rack nuts with uh, the screws. Nice that they include those in the box. And then the unit itself. Now these are actually fairly substantial. There are metal, complete metal construction, top and bottom. So it's nice when you see how well made these are. Now the 48 port one, a little bit more in depth. So it's a little bit longer. So take that into consideration if you're mounting this in a rack, make sure the rack has enough depth to handle a 48 port model of this. Oh, uh, they have the measurements and specs on the site. So. Let's take a little bit closer look at these before we get into the software. Move some things out of the way here. So I have removed the two screws from the back and two screws from the bottom, and then it just slides apart. So let's go ahead and open this thing up. Actually, I gotta take out the SFP. They keep a little rubber dust covers on them, which is nice. Get those out, and let's pop this thing open. Let's void a warranty. The good news is if I'm voiding the warranty, it's not showing that I'm voiding the warranty because they don't have any stickers that I could find at all to stop me from doing this or discourage, I shouldn't say stop me, discourage me from doing this because I'm gonna do it anyways. Because I wanna know what's inside these Unifies. So let's, a uh, little pry, a little pry there. It slides this way out. So get a little bit of, there we go. And she's open. I open it upside down, I guess. So. Flip it over so it slides a little forward like this, and then probably up. You're learning as I'm learning. No editing here. Hey, there we go. This is really heavy. Kind of cool. So you have the uh, Unify here in the front, and we got some glue around there holding that in. We're gonna look at that. Uh, but this is tap this real quick. Solid piece of metal, not sharp. I can hold it like this. I'm not worried about cutting myself and uh, very heavy. Now let's take a deeper look inside. Power supply, ports, but a lot of empty space. Tiny, tiny fan. Interesting, there's no feedback on the fan. Uh, it's, it's not a three wire fan. So uh, let me move the camera down closer so we can kind of dig into this a little bit. But this is this is nice and clean inside. There's not, not a mess in here at all. All right, so here's a little bit closer look of uh, what's inside. We see the power supply board over here. Pretty small, compact, uh, clean, and I like that. It doesn't look like a bunch of crap everywhere. <laughs> Some of these you'll see a lot of different wires. Here's our uh, wires for the LED for the front. Pretty tiny LEDs on there. When we have the different chips for each one of them, so we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six times two, so 12 of them. So each two of these control that port. Pretty good size heat sink here and a good size heat sink here for the processor on these. And this is some of the genius of the way they design Unify equipment is it all runs with a Linux kernel inside of it. There are cameras, there are Wi-Fi devices and their switches that you can terminal into these. And when we get into the software part, I'll be talking about that. So let's take a little bit closer look at the chips on here. Now it's upside down, but these are some G4820 209 SNG and I actually googled them and I found places selling them but not a lot of information on the chip itself but uh, everything's well put together the board itself and if you can read this down here this is a you know got the ubiquity stamp on there I like the way they do this you know so I can identify this board it's got their 
mark on it and it's really it's a nice design and like i said the bottom's metal i think the fan here is a little bit tiny but they know what they're doing and we let we let these run all day they get pretty warm but not like you're going to get burned so they definitely do push some heat and these fans are thermally activated so they will rev up when it first starts to do a test and then they uh, turn off completely and i guess come on as needed when you're doing data transfers and it heats up uh like I said, it's not that high. I don't have a thermal imaging for that. Now, this back over here is because it actually has console access on the back. Uh, here's the two SFP ports over here. Pretty straightforward. Nothing, nothing too exciting. But I want to at least take a look inside so I have a good idea of how this whole system works and looks inside. So here's the 48 port model. Pretty much the same. The uh, two processors on here, send two of these here. Like I said, I don't know what chips exactly are under there. So the design is pretty much the same as it was for there. It has the same LED in the front, uh, same basic clean power supply. They did put two fans, so they have one fan on this side and one fan on that side. So a little bit different there. And you have the four SFP ports versus the two. And this is another difference of the 48 port model. Two of these SFP ports are SFP plus, which means 10 gigabit ports. So you have two 10 gigabit ports, two gigabit SFP ports, then 48 gigabit ports on this. So the design and everything's pretty much the same. The software and the handling's all the same through the same Unify software. They just have a couple more ports, but you get that 10 gigabit. Now this also has a total switching capacity per the box, 70 gigabit. So that means everything can be transferring in the total amount of bandwidth they can handle going across the 70 which means lots of different things talking to lots of different things and we still have the same thing the same chips same chips exactly and configured the same way on here once again clean design nice inside everything's metal construction just like on the 24. a couple of side notes though uh, i noticed when i open it up and see if i can catch this on camera not my fingerprints these are some fingerprints that are pre in there that it came with they're kind of hard to see a little faint i'm trying to turn the brightness up to get them seen better but yeah there's a series of fingerprints that are kind of oily ones that are you can actually feel whatever it is so someone had glue on their hands maybe when they touched it uh that is an interesting side note i looked at it, i'm like huh there's fingerprints on that no wonder whose they are some ubiquity engineers all right so let's now uh, get into the software i'm going to go a little bit of the front of the case on these and then we'll get into the software and actually how these work all right, so it's time to jump into the software. My last little comment as a hardware is thank you, Unify, for designing it where the light for the network cable is where, where you plug in the cable. I don't like these places that put a separate light on the side of the switch. And a lot of manufacturers just do that. And it's like, oh, look, I plugged it in, but I have to look for the light and the port number. I like seeing it right next to each one of the network jacks. It's just a lot easier when you're plugging it in. The real magic in any managed switch is going to be in the software that runs it. And I really like the Unify software. We're using it to run everything in terms of the switching fabric for the systems. Now, I have a couple Wi-Fi in here and I, I left them plugged in for this demo. I actually plugged into our network because I wanted to show you some of the connectivity and topology. So the switches are plugged in, they're adopted, they're upgraded. It works just like any other Unify device. So if you're familiar with the other Unify line of products and the Unify controller software, which is free by the way, in case that comes up a lot, they give this, you buy their hardware, they get the software for free, but it does only work with their devices. This won't manage other switches or other Wi-Fi units. The switches are DHCP by default, so you don't have to try and figure out some default IP on them. Makes it really easy. And I leave things at DHCP. This allows me to uh, easily build a DHCP table, put all the MAC addresses in there, and assign everything where I want it. Uh, so I'm happy to leave it that way. But you can go into these switches, and I have an 8 port, a 48 port, and a 24 port. I didn't demo the 8 port, it really nothing significant on it. This is just for the 24 and 48. There's, they're very similar devices, just more ports. Uh, but when you go into config, you have the option if you want under the network to change it to static IP. So you can statically assign these if that's something you want. So you don't have to rely on DHCP servers being up when you reboot a switch. Anyways, the neat thing is when you have all these plugged in, and I really like this. So I comment about the lights next to the network port, but when you have them plugged in, you also get to see the ports here. It tells you like this one, for example, is not plugged in gigabit. This one is, so it's green versus orange. They got a little color coding here and uh, really neat. 
So let's look at the topology of these. This is a neat thing I want to start with in here. So this is not a map of my building. This is the default map. I've never bothered. Maybe I will I'll load the map of my building in here. And, but what it lets you do is drag the devices around to show them where in the building. That's pretty cool. This is really cool. This is your mapping to show you the different devices and how they're connected. And this is really clever. So what this does is there's the eight port and it goes into where most things are and it's, there's a dumb switch behind it. So the eight port sees everything plugged in uh, directly to it when it's obviously more devices here than the eight port. So it groups them all together because there's a unmanaged switch behind after the eight port. Then we have our 24 port switch and it draws a line. Then that's connecting to our 48 port switch. Then we have a Wi-Fi connected to that and we have our other Wi-Fi plugged into the 24. Then here's the Wi-Fi devices that show up plugged in and are attached to this particular Wi-Fi. And also you can do the link labels. So if you have multiple Wi-Fi's, it will show you which Wi-Fi it's connected through and give you the flow through. So it's just really novel. This builds it on the fly. There's nothing I did to make this and it just shows up. So uh, I can also just say, don't show me the clients and only show me this. So if you're building out networks and they expand and contract as you click them. So really helpful for finding things. And also when you go and show clients, let me zoom out again here. I'm just using the mouse to scroll around. It'll bring up the client over here and I can pull the information and details from that client and find out where how it's connected and how it's connected there. So it's connected to back area Wi-Fi, goes over here and uh, lets you kind of drill down. Really slick. This is just part of the software and it works for the ports for things. So let's go over here to the clients and here's my computer, Tom's computer. And when I click on this, it goes right to the port that my computer's plugged into. So it's really easy to find things. So it's on the 48 port switch and we named it 48 port switch and it's port number nine. And it'll let me go right to that port. So this is really slick the way the software helps you find things. So if you don't have a label network, when you plug all these in, you can easily go in here and start labeling out your network and your ports and understand what's connected where and start making the changes. Now back to the devices. Now when I first plugged them in before they're adopted part of the Unify, they'll be unmanaged. I just want to note, they work fine unmanaged. I mean, you don't get to take advantage of, of all the features and why would you buy one if you're not going to manage it? But just so you know, out of the box, they work as a switch. So here's all the devices and let's jump over to the network settings and show you how you build your network settings in here. So we'll go over here, we'll go to networks, and here's the network that we're on, 192.168.3 slash 24. So you can just edit this and you know set your network settings. And you wanna build some VLANs, no problem. So we have test three VLAN, test VLAN, and the VLAN ID form if you wanna create a new one, pretty easy. We're gonna say VLAN only, um, VLAN 40, because we'll get the idea of 40. And it's up to you how you want to name it. They have the, you know, nice text naming here. And then we're going to hit, go ahead and hit save. Now, what this does, I'm going to jump to the device real quick to show you. All these switches went to provisioning mode. And what that means is that setting gets pushed out and provisions to the switch. Now, whenever there's provisioning, there's a slight pause in the network. Not long, but if you're pinging, you'll see a few seconds pause for the provisioning to happen and it kind of disrupts the switch for a second. And if you notice the order at which they did it with the eight port, the 48 port took a little bit longer than the 24. I'm guessing just because there's uh, more ports to program takes a slightly longer time, but it's really, it's a matter of seconds. So it's not a big deal. But what I think is a little bit annoying is when I do things like this, you can name any port, whatever you want. So this is port six and we're gonna go ahead and name it because I know port six what does it have in here? The back area Wi-Fi plugged into it, as we said. So we're going to call this the Wi-Fi port. Port for, well, we'll just call it Wi-Fi for back area. So apply. Great. I applied it. It's provisioning it. So if everyone's running full tilt on the switch, there's going to be a slight delay before it works. And it's, like I said, it's maybe only one or two seconds, but it's, if you've worked in, you know, high demand environments, even a second blip, people go, oh my gosh, everything paused. Now it doesn't show disconnected on the network. Uh, it doesn't cause that level of problem, but it does pause network traffic slightly. Just wanted to make a side note of that, but I thought it was odd that it does it even when I name something. So I changed no functionality to switch. I just gave it a name. Now let's go back into the ports and just show you a couple other things. So you have these options in here for the profile overrides and 
the different profiles that we set up here. Now this is kind of cool because this is a two part thing. So here's the VLANs we set up. Here's VLAN 10, VLAN 40, test VLAN 3, and it's got the name in brackets there so you know which VLAN tag it is. Really simple. And it shows up on all the switches. So we're gonna go over here to ports on this 24 port one and grab any random port, even if it's not plugged in, doesn't matter, profile. And we can choose those networks and VLANs. This is kind of slick because it actually has a couple different options in here. So if we go back over here to our settings, profiles, switch ports, you can build actual profiles. So all or disabled, which is disabled at port altogether. So you can actually disable ports on there. Uh, so if you're worried about security, you go, I want the ports disabled unless I implicitly turn them on. Definitely an option there. Uh, and here's where you create the VLANs, but we can actually create a profile and some test profile. So I just give it a real simple name here. Now, if the switches are PoE, and you can mix PoE and non-PoE switches, this profile, maybe you wanted to modify the PoE settings. What's the native network for it? What are the tag networks and go through there? So we can say native LAN, I'll say select all, but maybe we'll drop out this one. So we wanted to be able to route just these networks, and then we hit save, and it's gonna go up here to the switches. You're gonna see them switch to provisioning. It's gonna takes a second, it doesn't, it's pretty fast. But then that profile will show up in there. So here's the one we created, some test profile, LAN, link negotiation, auto. So you see you can edit it because it's an editable one, it's a self-created one. Let me go over here to devices. Oh, we have a port open already, so let me close that so I can get to one. And here's a custom profile we set. And that allows us to set specific parameters on the port. So if you have some specific parameters, this makes it really easy to apply a bunch of them at once. Also, if you wanna apply a bunch of them at once, you can do it this way. You can select a few ports and group these into a VLAN or our custom profile, however you wanna do it. But that's real easy to grab segments of the switch and push all the settings to that segment of the switch. Makes it really easy for management because you can say, okay, this block is grouped to this and this block is grouped to that. And as you notice, I'm selecting them, they're physically laying out over here how those ports are based on the ones I selected. So it kind of gives you a visual reference of how the switch is laid out, what the switch looks like. This is also kind of cool too. Let me cancel what I was doing here. So close this, close. And I'm gonna show you an eight port switch. I'll pop this out real quick. I love the way it does the things. Now, this is the eight port one. Let's go to the 48 port, pop this one out. So you can create kind of these floating windows when you're doing it as well. So you can kind of look and compare side by side. It just intuitive software like this makes the switches a lot easier to manage, a lot easier to use. And also you may have noticed that there are uplinks and downlinks on these. So when you're looking at the network, the ports, the users that are attached to this network. Uplink to this is the 24 port switch. And by clicking it, it lets me pop this out again. So now here's the eight, the 48 and the 24. And we're gonna look at the downlinks on here. And it looks at what the downlink network devices are. So we know the uplink port gives us a little symbol. Then we can see the downlink devices. So we know this is uplink to the eight port switch and downlinked to the 48 port switch and downlinked to the LTS office Wi-Fi. And when we jump back over here to the map, so topology, move these out of the way and just close them. And we don't care about the clients. We just want to show the devices. We'll take out the link labels, make it clean. We can see that. So it goes here to here to here to here. It lays it out for you. So you can see as you build your network and as they plug in, it builds this in real time. So you can make sure that when you're doing some documentation that your documentation shows what this does. So you know if someone plugs something in wrong, there's a really nice feature. And it's just really cool the way it does this. It's doing it on the fly. We also did some testing. Uh, it does this and things to take about five minutes to refresh. You can though, and I'll show you this real quick in the uh, preferences, you can enable the refresh button in the preferences. And I went up here to the user and enabled that. And it puts this little button here. So if you're doing something and you don't want to just take a glance at it, but you go, I want to know now what's going on. You can do this and kind of force a refresh of the devices on, on there and it will 
requeue all the information so it builds the latest information. It only seems to delay a few seconds from then for things that are on different devices. So that's definitely really cool the way it does that. Now let's talk about a couple of features the Switch has. Uh, you can look at the performance of the Switch. It shows you the CPU uh, and information on there, like the utilization information, memory usage, uh, load averages. I don't know how super relevant these are. You can also go into the config on all the switches, click on the debug terminal, open terminal, and you're presented with the standard Linux command terminal in here. I like it because you don't have to, you can SSH into these, but you don't have to use any external software that way. You can just jump in this way. It's already dropped in at the like root slash management level. And we can go cat slash proc CPU info and see that these are all running little ARM processors. So they're pretty lightweight, but get the job done. And I don't think the load's overly relevant because it's not telling you the load of the network when it tells you load, it's telling you the load of the processor. You can actually run top on here. Uh, and I've noticed when we're passing traffic back and forth on here, it's not dumping a bunch of uh, load onto this because the chips themselves handle all the offload of the actual switching itself. So it, pretty straightforward. Now, in the services, by default, it has RTSP enabled, but you can go back to STP or disable that feature altogether. Uh, you also get 802.11x control if you want to set that up. So you can enable, uh, you know, locking in through a radius server, the IP 802.11x uh, uh, Mac authentication. So that is a feature on there. So you can really lock these down. So you, your standard features you get with a managed switch. Now, something kind of novel here, and I'm gonna go over here to the 48 port one and pop it out, close that. When you're editing the ports, the other options that come up, let's say we want to group some ports together for link aggregation. You can link aggregate all the different ports together. You just have to do them sequentially. So we're going to go here. And here's the mirroring option for a port. So if we wanted to mirror it and put the other port that you wanted to have a mirror on, you can aggregate the port. So we'll go ahead and aggregate a couple of ports together and then hit apply. And when we come down here, now I only have to edit and it says aggregating port 45. Pretty straightforward and simple. So it makes it easy to do and makes it easy to edit. And if you want to turn that off, just turn it back into switching, apply. They're back to being switching ports. I believe you can aggregate the SFPs as well. Yes, so it will let you aggregate the SFPs as well. So that's cool. So I can do that and I can aggregate the SFP ports. So this does have two 10 gigabit SFP plus ports and then two SFPs. It's only under 48 that I'm aware of. They don't have any 24 port miles I've seen or I'm aware of any coming out that have 10 gigabit on them. That would be kind of nice if they did, but I don't think too many companies make those. Now, other options on the ports, you can assign it specific VLANs like I was showing. So you can easily assign that there and say this port is for that VLAN, uh, enable port eight isolation or manually also override the duplex modes on here. So pretty common stuff that you can find in a managed switch. I just really like how easy they made it to do and how I can just label things on any port of what's on that port. Actually, I had my laptop plugged in here and I unplugged it so it still just labeled Tom's laptop. This is kind of tool. I like how it puts a little eye on there when you set it to port mirroring. So if I mirror a port, I edit it real quick, you just pick the port you want to mirror, pick the port you want to mirror it to, and away you go, you end up with a little mirror on there. So right there, port mirroring. And if you notice in the background, it paused for a second and flipped, was, that was reprovisioning it. So kind of neat. So if you had some monitoring devices you want, you can just go mirror a certain port to push all the data also to that port. Like I said, these are pretty straightforward things you get with a managed switch and it comes in here. I just really like how intuitive. So I'm not trying to log in a web interface for these. and. Instead of logging into web interface for each individual one is what I meant. So instead of trying to go into each one, I can do everything from here and it just cascades to the everything else. And when you add new devices, it gets all those same VLANs. So it makes setting all this up pretty much a breeze. So you don't have to try and figure out and match everything when you set up a new switch. You just adopt it into the network and all the settings, including custom profiles and all that just come right back in with it. So 
pretty much a good overview of these. I'm really happy with them, the performance and everything. You know, we did basic testing. It didn't really run any problems. I didn't have enough devices to really load this up, and I didn't have an SFP10 to do that. I believe you can find some tests that people have done on these, but they work as they say on the box uh, from what I've read in the forums and reviews. There's, they, you know, they claim the spec on them. They match the spec. They are full of gigabit, uh, non-blocking, plenty of bandwidth you can get through here. And it just works really well. They really haven't had any headaches with them. Uh, we've deployed these for clients. These ones are getting deployed at a larger installation. I wish I could show some of the installations we've done, uh, but unfortunately there's a lot of you know security reasons and privacy reasons we don't show clients. We build everything in our lab and uh, show you how it works. But hopefully this is a good overview of these switches and the, uh, I'll probably do an, a Unify review of the Unify controller software again, because now that we've got to this version 5.6.2.2, it's probably been about a year since I reviewed the software overall. And that's one thing I really like about Unify is their software keeps getting better. And we were just laughing at just how old this uh, Wi-Fi device on our network is, when it says LTS Office Wi-Fi. This is one of their version ones, I don't know, three or four years ago we installed this. Still works great, still getting updates. The software still handles all the updates, firmware updates and everything for it, and still functions with this one that is only, I don't know, it arrived a week ago, so it's it's not too old. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a slightly older model, I think they have V3 hardware out now. But Unify keeps updating the software, so you keep getting more features. So you see, you get everything you see here, but if you buy this six months from now, there's probably gonna be a new version with more features added to it. So the Unify software keeps improving, keeps adding features, and uh, you just, keep updating it. I've been really excited for the company because they're also very responsive. If you find any flaws in it, you know, post it in the forums. They're very quick to get updates on these and uh, close bugs if you find them. Anyways, hopefully this is helpful and make some decisions on these. Give them a big thumbs up. Really happy with the device. Uh, no complaints with it and it works really well. All right. Thanks for watching. If you like the content here, if you have some questions, uh, leave them in the comments below.